four of you are going to be on the panel together to start this off. Good afternoon, and welcome to the New York City Council and our Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. My name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I'm proud to be the chair of this committee. I'm uh, joined by committee member, council member Karen Kozlowitz from Queens, and I know we have other members of the committee coming uh, as well. Always a lot going on at the New York City Council. <laughs> want to welcome all of you to this oversight hearing on culture paths and other partnerships between New York City's cultural organizations and public libraries. We're also joined by Councilmember Francisco Moya, also of Queens and of the committee. And seeing the four of you on this panel together is, is like a dream because as the chair of cultural affairs and libraries, I don't believe in the nine years that I've been the chair of this committee that we've ever had the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs and the three CEOs and presidents of our library systems on the same panel at the same time together. Uh, but obviously, I know, and I believe all of my colleagues know, the importance of libraries and culture. And of course, the people of the city of New York only benefit when you're all working together, when we are marrying culture, the arts, and libraries, and of course, Libraries have always had <coughs> cultural programming, the arts, as a part of their offerings. Uh, and, and I know Commissioner Finkel Pearl is a big fan of our public libraries uh, and a user of our public libraries and a supporter. But uh, Culture Pass is this exciting, new, uh, and enhanced way that all of you are working together. and allowing folks to use one of the greatest single uh, cards that anyone can ever have, which is a library card, which is a really a, uh, a passport to the world in so many different ways, uh, and use that to gain even more enhanced access uh, to some of the wonders of our cultural organizations. And uh, obviously IDNYC is this wildly successful program, uh, but this is a way to get at some of the same uh, goals, but in a slightly different way. And we can't do enough to invite people into the offerings of the city more. And uh, I've always thought libraries are the most democratic institutions in our society uh, because they're free, open to all, non-judgmental, no questions asked, just come. Uh, and, uh, and we want uh, our cultural organizations, obviously, uh, uh, to be as accessible to all. And they do a great job of becoming more accessible all the time. This is part of that. So we want to talk a little bit, obviously, about Culture Pass and how it's going and how it's been successful and how people are uh, taking advantage of this program and some of the other ways that I know our libraries and our Department of Cultural Affairs are working together uh, to enhance the lives of the people of the city of New York. So uh, I want to thank uh, all of the folks who help put this together. Matt Wallace, my chief of staff, and uh, the committee's counsel, Brenda McKinney, uh, legislative policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, and our finance analyst, Alia Ali. Uh, I just want to recognize uh, council member Joe Borelli uh, from Staten Island has joined us, and I know that he is a big fan of our libraries uh, as well. So, <laughs> uh, so with that, uh, I don't know who is going first, Commissioner Finkelpearl, and then we'll uh, hear from our, our library systems 
Oh, but first, um, uh, for Commissioner Finkelperl, uh, you are subject to our oath, uh, not our public okay. library presidents and CEOs. Commissioner, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Ben Bramer and members of the committee. I am Tom Finkelpearl, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. I'm here today to testify in regards to Culture Pass and other partnerships between our city's cultural organizations and the public library systems. I have stated this publicly before, but it bears repeating almost verbatim what the chair just said. I firmly believe that our public libraries are great, open, democratic institutions. With a footprint that reaches every neighborhood across the five boroughs, they are central to making New York fairer and more vibrant. Branches serve every community in our city, providing a range of programs and services, including culture. My mother was a librarian, and I know that Chair Van Bramer is a proud Queens Library alum himself. So I'm excited to be uh, for the opportunity today to explore the connections between libraries and culture in greater depth. The Create NYC Cultural Plan, released in July of 2017, laid out recommendations related to cultural programming and libraries. The library systems were critical to the public outreach for the cultural plan. In March 2017, we worked with the three systems to place public feedback materials in six languages at 31 high-traffic library branches, yielding more than 1,200 survey responses. So perhaps it's no surprise that the importance of local libraries to residents infuses the cultural plan. Residents see them as vital sources of information, both local and global, spaces for programming and social connection, and community hubs. For our millions of neighbors who speak languages other than English at home, libraries provide a way to receive services and stay engaged. One piece of feedback cited in the plan, originally in Polish, reads, more arts program for children in libraries. They are cultural centers. Such universal support is hard to come by these days, and it speaks to how libraries have evolved beyond being book repositories to remain central to the lives of New Yorkers. With such a clear mandate uh, in the cultural plan to support more partnerships between libraries and cultural organizations, we wanted to move quickly to do just that. So last year, we provided over $250,000 to the three library systems to support new cultural programming. At Brooklyn Public Library, this, funded <coughs> this funding supported Traditions in Transition. This was a partnership with the Brooklyn Arts Council to document folk and traditional artists performing and demonstrating important traditional art form uh, from underrepresented cultural communities. At New York Public Library, this funded, uh, funding supported Notes from the Reading Life. For this partnership with the National Book Foundation, New York Public Library hosted a new discussion series featuring non-literary celebrities, including athletes, chefs, and actors, who discussed their connection to reading and identified a book they recommended to the neighborhood residents, copies of which were provided to the attendees. At Queens Library, this funding supported What a Wonderful World, in partnership with the Louis Armstrong House Museum, the library bought, um, brought Louis Armstrong's legacy to library branches throughout the borough through a series of cultural events surrounding the 50th anniversary of Armstrong's recording of What a Wonderful World. In addition to creating new linkages between programming and audiences, cultural groups and libraries are also establishing a physical connections. Some of these are longstanding, some are in the works. These unique partnerships build on the respective strengths and expertise of each institution and their mutual commitment to public service for free exchange of ideas. The oldest of these is the New York Public Library uh, for the Performing Arts, located in Lincoln Center's campus. Its collections include historic recordings, videotapes, autograph manuscripts, correspondence, sheet music, stage designs, press clippings, programs, posters, and photographs. Its programming brings these materials to life for library visitors. Last year, we announced new capital funding for a unique partnership between the Brooklyn Children's Museum and the Brooklyn Library. BPL's Brower Park Library will be re relocated inside the museum. The project will enable the Brower Park Library, currently located at St. Mark's Avenue in Crown Heights, to move into a modern, family-oriented facility on the premises of the Brooklyn Children's Museum, while saving Brooklyn Public Library $8 million in repair expenses for the branch's current home. It will also allow the museum to resume its tradition of lending items from its 30,000 object collection. The Queens Museum, in a plan originally developed during my time at the institution and Chair Van Bramer's time at the library, will house a branch of the Queens Library inside the building. This will build on the institution's longstanding collaboration with the library system, centered on the New Yorkers program. 
This can also work the other way around, with cultural organizations taking up residence inside of a library. The Affordable Art Space Development Group, SpaceWorks, is one, of the good, one a good example that we funded through DCLA. They developed an underutilized second floor of the Williamsburg branch of the Brooklyn Public Library into affordable re uh, rehearsal and visual arts studio space. The space is used heavily by local dance groups, musicians, and artists in other disciplines. They also provide regular community program that activates the space for local residents. DCLA often works directly with the libraries. Earlier this month, DCLA's Disability Inclusion Associate led a public workshop on creating facility and facilitating tactile experiences for cultural ex audiences at New York Public Library's Andrew Haskell Braille and Talking Book Library. The workshop, which trained attendees on creating and facilitating tactile experiences for audiences, was attended by representatives from cultural groups around the city. Mm -hmm. This great partnership with the New York Public Library is one of the ways we're delivering on the commitment uh, to better engage people with disabilities as audience members, artists, and cultural workers. We hope to provide our constituent organizations more of such appropriate opportunities in the future. DCLA's Public Artists in Residence, or PAIR, program has also tapped into library networks. With funding from Stavros Niarchos Foundation, DCLA partnered with Brooklyn Public Library to name Brian Dory's uh, New York City Public Artists in Residence with the Department of Veteran Services. For the last year, Dory's and his company, Theater of War, have produced staged readings of Greek plays in library branches and other venues citywide. These productions include community discussions that explore trauma and build connections. The many connections between the cultural, uh, culture and libraries are well established. Among the organizations funded by the Department of Cultural Affairs Cultural Development Fund last year, nearly 100 applicants identified over 180 different library branches where their programming would take place. Here's a small sampling of these programs. Willie Mae Rock Camp for Girls conducted songwriting workshops at BPL's Central Branch. Chinese Theater Works uh, performed original productions and traditional works at a number of Queens Library locations, including Elmhurst, Flushing, Glen Oaks, and Jackson Heights. New York Council on the Humanities hosted one of its community conversation series at Park Chester New York Public Library Branch in the Bronx. And Soundy Ground Historical Society partnered with St. George Library Center in Staten Island for an oral history project. And, oh, and finally, the Aperture Foundation held an artist lecture at the Schomburg Center in connection with their exhibition, Black Dandy Resistance. There are dozens of more examples of such partnerships. Clearly, cultural organizations understand that libraries are ideal spaces to connect with New Yorkers. Uh, I'm getting there. Almost finished. Uh, my agency's Percent for Art program has also been commissioning permanent artworks for library branches. From Alan McCollum's installation at the recently completed Elmhurst Library to the conservation of the monumental doors at Brooklyn Public Library's Central Branch by Thomas Jones, these commissions enrich and engage with the built environment of libraries in all five boroughs. In addition to 17 completed proje projects in libraries, there are another 14 commissions currently in process. Culture Pass is another exemplary partnership between cultural community and the library systems. The program allows library patrons to check out a limited number of free passes to participating cultural institution. It joins a range of truly innovative new ways that libraries are engaging residents in 2018, from free streaming on such services as Canopy to the range of programs we've discussed here today. The library systems themselves conceived of this exciting new model to open up doors to cultural institutions. It aligns with the plans and vision of the cultural plan to leverage public libraries as neighborhood hubs for social and cultural activity. As we've seen with the IDNYC cultural benefits, New Yorkers are eager for new ways to connect with library groups. Culture Pass provides one more point of entry that demonstrates what it means to foster spaces that are truly for everyone. Since it launched this summer, Culture Pass has been used by 70,000 visitors. I applaud my colleagues in the library systems and cultural organizations for this exciting achievement. And I believe it's not enough to simply open a door. You have to actively invite people in. To that end, we worked with NYC and company and the libraries to promote Culture Pass on Link NYC kiosks and bus shelters, with an emphasis on underserved communities. We're also promoting on social media and other channels. We look forward to continuing to spread the word about Culture Pass and other programs that expand access to culture for all New Yorkers. Thank you for your opportunity uh, to highlight the important linkages between the cultural sector and the libraries, public libraries. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And we were hanging on every word, so we're not... <laughs> There's a lot to say. Anyway, wanting you to rush. Is Linda up first for libraries? Yes. And we were hanging on every word. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Uh, 
Commissioner Finkelperl. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, members of the committee. I'm Linda Johnson. I'm the President and CEO of Brooklyn Public Library, and I appreciate the opportunity to share information um, and, frankly, my excitement uh, about Culture Pass, which um, is uh, a program that started at the library in July and has been um, successful beyond our wildest uh, dreams, which um, brings me personally great joy as a rabid museum goer myself. I think nothing could be greater than actually creating opportunities like this for our patrons. Just two months ago, we announced a new library-led initiative that offers New Yorkers free admission to a variety of cultural institutions across the city. Cultural pass, Culture Pass allows library card holders to reserve day passes for any of 43 participating cultural institutions in the five boroughs, from the Botanic Gardens in Brooklyn to Wave Hill in the Bronx and the Noguchi Museum in Queens, library patrons can now explore even more of the cultural treasures our city has to offer. And of course, like everything we do, these passes are offered for free. Here's how it works. Library card holders go to culturepass.nyc and log in with their library card, uh, li log in with their library card, browse by date or venue, and reserve passes online. A patron, a patron can reserve a pass good for up to two people, though some institutions will allow up to four. Every month, 7,300 passes are available to be checked out. Library patrons can have up to two concurrent reservations at any time and may reserve one pass per institution per year. The success of the program far exceeded the expectations of the libraries and the participating institutions. When the, when, when the website went live, we were surprised at just how quickly our patrons dove in. One couple wrote us with this heartening feedback. Thank you for establishing Culture Pass. It's so inspiring and reminds us of the beauty this city provides its people. We are such a gem on the map because of programs like this. Culture Pass currently has more than 28,000 active reservations, which means to date 70,000 people will be visiting cultural institutions thanks to the program. We are continually adding new partners. Since the program launched, it has quickly grown from 33 to 43 participating institutions recently adding new marquee destinations, including the Museum of Natural History and the, Mu the Museum of Art and Design and the New York Botanic Gardens. We will loan 87,600 free passes for an extraordinary 248,400 individual visits this year alone, and expect the number to grow as we continue bringing new partners on board. Culture Pass furthers the library's mission of providing free information and access to all people, while also helping cultural institutions attract new visitors from every corner of the city. It allows libraries to act as a bridge to the cultural resources that are critical to the community discourse we help cultivate every day. We plan to host new educational programs at our libraries in collaboration with our Culture Pass partners to further enhance the program experience. Funding from the Stavos Nyarkos Foundation, Charles H. Revson Foundation, and the New York Community Trust's Thriving Communities Program enabled us to develop the program, build the online system, and staff the program. But what is truly extraordinary is the generosity of the participating cultural institutions which at current levels amounts to $3.4 million a year in, in library visits. Culture Pass has grant funding for three years, and we expect to operate the program beyond that, expanding to include even more diverse offerings for patrons in the years ahead. Brooklyn Public Library is not new to cultural programming or partnerships. We host approximately 70,000 free programs a year including BPL Presents, featuring authors, musicians, visual and performing artists from around the world. In 2016, 
we began a partnership with Brian Dorries that Commissioner Finkelpearl mentioned as well and Theater of War to bring renowned actors to Brooklyn to perform dramatic readings of ancient Greek works, <coughs> followed by community conversation relating the text to social issues of the day. This project is now citywide, and Brian is one of the city's public artists in residence. BPL is proud to be a co-producer of the residency and has hosted many stirring performances in our libraries. Last year, funding from the Department of Cultural Affairs allowed Brooklyn Public Library to partner with the Brooklyn Arts Council to present the Brooklyn Folk Art and Artists series, highlighting Brooklyn's immigrant communities. Performance by 20 folk and traditional artists were held in a dozen Brooklyn neighborhood libraries, bringing attention to art forms in need of preservation. Brooklyn Public Library is also embarking on another exciting cultural partnership. Next year, we will move the Brower Park Library to the ground floor of the Brooklyn Children's Museum, a city-owned building a few blocks from the current library, which is a branch that we rent and has significant deferred maintenance. The new branch will be a unique cultural resources, resource for families in central Brooklyn. Visitors will be able to check out books from the library and borrow items from the museum's collection, as well as enjoy collaborative programs. A strong partner in the, the, the Brooklyn Children's Museum is beloved by the community. Currently, they are the most popular culture pass reservation in the city and very generous participants in the program. Finally, Brooklyn Public Library will open a new library at 300 Ashland Place in the Brooklyn Cultural District, intended to serve the needs of, thri of a thriving community that boasts more than 70 cultural organizations. The branch, housed in a cultural condominium at the foot of an Enrique Norton building, will focus on the diversity of arts and culture in Brooklyn and will offer curated collections of books, magazines, and other media, as well as programming in collaboration with local groups to complement the cultural calendar. This branch, like Culture Pass, will democratize access to the arts and culture for the community it serves and beyond. It is extremely rewarding to join with world-class cultural institutions and partners in government so committed to strengthening the cultural fabric of New York City. We are proud to be working with you to expand the ways we provide a democratic and welcoming space for all to engage in learning enrichment of the high, and enrichment of the highest quality. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight our recent successes. Good afternoon, I'm Tony Marks, president of the New York Public Library, and I also want to thank uh, Chair Von Bramer, uh, the members and the entire city council, uh, Tom uh, Finkelpearl, the commissioner, and the entire Department of Cultural Affairs, and all of our cultural institution partners for making to this uh, success we are celebrating today possible. Um, this, uh, the, this idea came up organically through the branches in response to community needs. I know that success has a thousand uh, fathers, so I've heard lots of different stories. Our story, uh, which we believe to be true, is that we have an innovation projects uh, program where we encourage staff to propose ideas from sort of the bottom up, generously funded by the Revson Foundation, and in 2014, the Offendorfer Library won an innovation project for this idea to uh, provide free passes from their branch to the Children's Museum of Art, the Children's Museum of Manhattan, and to the Guggenheim. Uh, there was, of course, an immediate, hugely positive result, and inspired all of us, and I know everyone sitting here and everyone in the audience has been working hard at this, to think even bigger. Um, particularly grateful to Tom and his colleagues for corralling these, uh, these wonderful, amazing cultural institutions um, to uh, happily um, Jo join in. Um, the, uh, I think it's clear we've outpaced every expectation um, in, the, in the 21st century. The clearest sign of that is when we started it, the, the Culture Pass um, uh, site crashed for several hours, so that's success, right? <laughs> Apparently. The, um, we got it back up and running, so that's good. Um, the New York Times has covered the program six separate times 
uh, referring to the passes as golden tickets. I think that's a reference to Willy Wonka, probably. Um, the uh, and um, we, we're just you know amazed by it. And the anecdotes sort of really bring this home. Whether hearing from a young mother in the Bronx who can now afford educational playdates with other children at these institutions, a college student who can enhance their studies uh, with such visits, a family of four that can now consider museums a viable option for weekend options. For, for weekend outings, um, and so many young patrons who are having their first experience at these museums. Let's be very clear. New York City has the crown jewels of cultural institutions, certainly in the United States and I believe in the world. And too many New Yorkers do not, do not feel that they can, and they can't afford. They do not feel welcome. and. They have not taken advantage. They haven't left their neighborhoods um, to go to these places. And that is a, a hugely lost opportunity, and I'm being polite. Um, this ingenious program, this partnership, um, has opened our crown jewels to the great source of strength of New York, which is the diversity of our population, um, who now are informed not just by what they learn at the libraries, but what they see and learn and are informed by at these cultural institutions. And I know the cultural institutions, um, uh, I was talking with Dan Weitz from the Met just the other day, are just delighted to see that the audience shift um, from our parents' generation uh, in these institutions and how essential that is. Uh, since the launch, the New York Public Library has received 81,000 applications. That's uh, for new library cards. We like that. That's a 66% increase over the same time last year. It means we can off use the, cult the library cards to offer culture passes, but we can also then, of course, work with these folks to say, and here's what the library can do for you. And, of course, everything we do um, is free. <laughs> um, of, as has already been noted by my, my colleagues, um, this is, uh, all, this is an important but only one of the many cultural programs. In 2018, we offered 7,000 cultural programs with a particular focus in high-need communities. Uh, Tom made reference to the Theater of War productions, bringing classics to communities uh, um, that probably thought they were sort of arcane and irrelevant and showing how, um, how powerful Long Day's Journey into Night is. Uh, in Mott Haven, where, where ish, people are uh, uh, living the issues of drug addiction, uh, or at St. George's, uh, et cetera, and also, as Tom made reference to, the partnership with the National Book Foundation. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a trustee of the National Book Foundation of the Notes of Reading Life of bringing the programs that maybe were too often concentrated by us and our center out into the branches plus the Library for Performing Arts and the Schomburg Center. You know, preserving and making available knowledge at a time when facts and truth are arguably more important than ever and getting more confused with each other than ever. Um, inspiring creativity when we are going to need it more than ever. Um, the commissioner's work, the, my colleagues' work at Brooklyn and Queens um, and these great cultural institutions are really breaking down the barriers in ways that has, haven't been seen before and really are essential for the future, not just of this city, but of this country. So, Tom, Chair Van Bramer, the entire council, our peer, our colleagues in these institutions, thank you for making this possible. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Linda. And to Chair Van Bramer, to the Commissioner. Already I'm going to go off script, so I'm just warning you beforehand. <laughs> I, I think this is one of those rare drop the mic moments. I'll drop a pen instead. <laughs> um, when you talk about partnership and collaboration, I think you're looking at it both here on this panel, but also in the audience as well. And this partnership has benefited the residents of New York City, especially those communities that we were targeting to reach out to. And again, with the chair's leadership, as well as the commissioner's leadership, and obviously with my colleagues and those in the audience from our cultural institutions, 
we're doing good stuff. I mean, and really reaching people that we have not reached before. And I just want to reinforce something that the chair talked about around the true democratic institution role that the libraries play. Uh, we play those roles rather strongly. People walk through our doors, so this partnership has benefited those people and more people than ever before. So I'll just deal with a couple of facts because Linda and Tony have basically stated it all along with the commissioner. Uh, I want to thank our foundation partners for their support. Uh, I also want to thank the commissioner and the chair for their support and obviously TriLi and one of our many uh, initiatives that we work together on. This has been a benefit to our residents. Uh, in the week after the launch of Culture Pass, Queens Library saw a 47% increase in the number of library card applications compared to the same period last year, 47%. It is so popular that at least according to the manager of our Forest Hills branch, uh, an entire families have come to sign up for their library cards and moments later have turned around to reserve and print their culture passes. Just think about it. They're coming for their library cards and then turn around and really wanted their culture passes. In total, more than 5,200 Queens library card holders have secured passes to date, accounting for about 19% of the total number of the program reservations. Of the 41 participating cultural institutions, seven are located in the borough of Queens, and they include uh, the Lewis Latimer House Museum, Lewis Armstrong Museum, MoMA PS1, and the Gottschalk Museum, the Queens Historical Society, the Queens Museum, and the Sculpt Sculpture Center. Moving forward, we will continue to educate the public about Culture Pass and work to recruit more cultural organizations in the borough to join this extraordinary effort. And then one of the other sidebar pieces, it has allowed people to move outside of their borough. So when we take a look at the data, we'll see that a lot of people who are coming through our Queens store really are not going to Queens cultural institutions. They're going to other boroughs, and that's the way it should be, and also the reverse, where people are coming to Queens as well. And so it really just broadens the opportunity for individuals to see what New York City is about, and not just a neighborhood or a borough in particular. Uh, in addition to Culture Pass, Queens Library actively works with Department of Cultural Affairs on many other initiatives, including Create New York City, uh, the first ever citywide cultural plan, which was the result of Chair Van Bramer's hard work and vision. Matter of fact, as another aside, one day the chair and the commissioner in one of our libraries in Queens, and I said, let me just pop in to say hi. And it was an engaged citizenry there, really participating in the discussions, and it really laid the foundation along with the outreach to the other library system as far as where we are in our relationship with each other. Uh, last fiscal year, uh, DCLA awarded the Queens Library a grant of $85,000, as the commissioner mentioned, for joint programming with Queens cultural organizations, of which the commissioner referred to was the What a Wonderful World initiative, which celebrated the 50th anniversary of the popular Louis Armstrong song, with programs at every branch in our system from April to June. Uh, approximately 2,500 customers participated in dozens of activities, programs, and musical performances related to this marvelous song. I still hear the song in the back of my head. Head. How many times yeah. did you hear it? <laughs> over and over again. And thanks to Nayeli, who's in the audience, I will continue to hear about it because it is part of a great initiative. Because of the success of this initiative, DCLA has engaged us again, and this year will generously provide us with new funding to form partnerships with cultural institutions in the borough. Uh, we look forward to sharing these relationships in the future. We have also partnered with DCLA to bring world-class cultural performances and art to New York City's neighborhoods. One example, as Tony indicated, and Linda indicated, and the commission indicated, is the Theater War program, in which actors read ancient Greek plays that focus on the impact of war, followed by discussions with community members uh, about the issues raised in the readings, such as domestic violence, mental health, and addiction. The readings and conversations have taken place at our Central Library, Flushing Library, and Cambria Heights Library, and has drawn over 500 people to those libraries for those types 
types of discussions. We have also had strong partnership, as the Commission indicated, with the Queen's Museum. We work in tandem with the museum on initiatives such as our Queen's Memory Project and also our gala that we're holding there on October 23rd, for anybody who might be interested, uh, which collects personal histories and photographs and other records of contemporary life in Queens. In addition, it helps our older adult department to deliver art history and art classes and projects to our homebound customers. We are also collaborating with the museum on its Queens International Exhibition that starts in November, which is going to be really unique and really different, uh, and through which three of our libraries, Central, Flushing, and Left Rack City, will have exhibits and workshops and Q&A sessions with participating artists through February of 2019. Next month, our Culture Connection Program, uh, which is a little bit different than this, uh, at Central Library will celebrate its fifth year anniversary. Uh, this program on many evenings and afternoons has transformed our Central Library into a Broadway stage featuring celebrated musicians and other live performers. In total, Queens Library last year hosted over 1,100 cultural programs comprised of art exhibits, music concerts, and more at no cost to our customers. Over 114,000 individuals attended our programs, an increase of 148% compared to the previous year. These numbers reflect how our community libraries can serve as extensions of the city's other cultural institutions. Our Langston Hughes Community Library and Cultural Center is home to the Black Heritage Reference Center of Queens County. Serving historians, scholars, researchers, and students, educators, and regular customers with a comprehensive reference and circulating collection totaling 40,000 volumes of material related to black culture. Uh, in its cultural arts programs offers independent video screenings, stage presentations, panel discussions, musical concerts, artists' exhi exhibits, exhibitions, and gallery openings, literature, poetry readings, open mic nights, and the annual Langston Hughes celebration in February and our annual Kwanzaa celebration in December. Queens Library's Hip Hop Programs and Culture Initiative offers programs and events that examine the five core elements of hip hop. And there'll be a test later on for those in the audience, as well as on the panel, on what those five elements are. But to help you along, emceeing, DJing, breaking, graffiti, and knowledge. We all knew that. While recognizing and documenting and celebrating the positive evolution of hip-hop culture. Stop laughing over there. Uh, and I don't even have to look up to know that you are. Spoken word, DJ mixing, technology, breakdance, panel discussions, lectures, art exhibitions, and artist talks are just a few examples of the popular program this initiative offers. We have an impressive music score collection, which probably, in all seriousness, a lot of you did not know, uh, at the Central Library's Fine Arts and Recreation. Division. It consists of over 80,000 pieces of sheet music and music related books, ranging from ancient to contemporary music from different genres and various countries, and over 44,000 volumes of music CDs and DVDs. With the closure of the last classical sheet music store in New York City in 2015, Queens Library has become increasingly important resource for musicians and music lovers alike, and we are proud to be able to fill this particular gap. By providing free access to the performing and fine arts, we are opening new avenues of wonder, discovery, and learning to all New Yorkers. They deserve no less. With that, I thank you all for the, this committee, for your time this afternoon, but also thank you for your leadership, both chair and commissioners and members of the council and my colleagues, our colleagues for strong commitments to our libraries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dennis, that was one of the most entertaining testimonies you've ever <laughs> I try. provided. And uh, unlike some of the other folks who have sat at that table over the years, when you go off script, uh, I don't worry. And uh, <laughs> there are some people in the audience who understand what I'm talking about. but. Um, uh, but Jonathan doesn't have to worry as much as some other people have over the years uh, in, that, in that position. Uh, so uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you. And um, these numbers are really staggering. Uh, this is an incredibly successful program. And, uh, and it's, it's fascinating, and people should know. Um, I also want to uh, give uh, all of you credit for uh, working together, because sometimes we can be competitive in a world of finite resources, but I think 
when we all work together, in particular, uh, these two incredibly important areas that I am privileged to be the chair of, uh, only good things can happen for the people of the city of New York. So I would want to know, where do you think this is going? Um, how long can it go on? How big can it get? And how much money would you need to be able to continue it and keep going? We currently have funding for three years. Um, the bulk of the investment from the operations standpoint has already occurred, building a system and hiring somebody to um, manage the program. Um, and so our hope is, of course, to be able to secure funding to be able to carry this forward. And I think um, there's a good chance that will happen because, as I said, the investment um, has already been made. So assuming that the cultural institutions are still interested in participating with us, the library would certainly be more than pleased um, to continue to manage the project. And from um, the feedback that we've gotten thus far, um, this really is an extraordinary way for cultural institutions to reach pa library patrons that otherwise would not per perhaps feel welcome um, in their institutions and have not perhaps realized just how far the museums and cultural institutions in our city have gone to make their institutions more welcoming to all New Yorkers. Can I just say Yep. Um, I have an interesting statistic, which I believe to be true, uh, which is that about... I hope it's true, because you swore an oath at the beginning uh, of this. That's <laughs> why... He believes it to be true. It's already hedging. I'm head... That's why I'm <laughs> under <laughs> oath. Hedging right. So I believe that, uh, and we can... Uh, that the total cumulative attendance in person at the library systems, cumulatively, is about 42 million a year. Great? Libraries? That's a little less. A little, 40, 42 million. That's almost exactly the same as, because we do know the numbers on the cultural side. So there's 40 million people, 41 million people going to cultural institutions, all of them, and about the same going to the libraries. The big difference is the libraries is almost entirely New Yorkers, correct? I mean, in numbers. Yeah. You have people, yeah. oh, yeah. scholars coming yeah. from elsewhere, but that's going to be thousands, not yeah. millions. So the idea of saying that there's an untapped audience there, because you know, we all know that large percentages of uh, attendance at some museums are people from out of town. And that's great, and we're all for that. But those New Yorkers, they're New Yorkers who are being left out of the picture, and this is this incredible opportunity. So we, that's why we're so excited about this and want to make this work uh, long term. Um, and Tom, the IDNYC program, which is wildly successful, how is this complementary and, and uh, do people see a difference between this and that? Yeah. I think so. Oh, thanks. Um, I mean, there's a big difference, which is if you have your IDNYC, you get a one-year membership once, right? So that's, that's something that exposes you to cultural institutions. We're very glad that some institutions have then retained those folks as, um, you know, as members long-term. But that's a one-time, one-year deal. This is something you can continually do. I think there are limits on how many times you can right. do it each year. But... Um, so they're very different, and, and it's a one ticket, one time, you know, for one institution, versus a really in-depth experience at a small, no at, at a similar number of institutions. We both have about forty. Uh, so I think that they're completely complementary. We've given away about seven hundred thousand free memberships at institutions by this time. Yeah, so it is wildly successful, also. But we also crashed our website. Remember that when it when it started, and so did Obamacare, and lots of good stuff crashed websites. So I was you know, happy to see that, although I remember you went on, uh, Linda went on public radio, as I did the day that our website was crashing uh, for IDNYC. But uh, all joking aside, I mean, these are wildly successful programs. I think other cities are looking at this. I'm a member of the World Cities Cultural Forum, and we have been talking to 27 of the largest cities in the world, cultural affairs departments, and people want to replicate these programs around the world. Um, so... I love the fact that you're all getting more library card applications, and those numbers were staggering too uh, in terms of you know, the increases you've seen since. Um, uh, Brooklyn, you didn't report your number, I don't think, in your testimony. I, I didn't, but the number um, is that we're about 60% higher for the period of time than we were right. same time last year. I mean, those are amazing things, right? I mean, libraries are always 
uh, trying to uh, figure out ways to reach yeah. those who don't yet have a library card because right. everybody should have a library card. Um, and so uh, this has proven extremely beneficial in so many different ways, uh, which is great to see that kind of interest in getting a library card because they'll, they'll use Culture Pass, but then they'll also card. take some uh, materials out that maybe they hadn't uh, thought that particular branch that they're in had. And, and it's just it's just so good on so many different levels. Um, so we had a question about the the, the demographic information, uh, because part of what we're also trying to do is to reach underserved communities. Um, and obviously, the libraries uh, and our, our cultural partners work every single day to make sure that every single New Yorker, whether uh, they're uh, an immigrant, whether they are undocumented, where they are um, uh, in a low-income community, that we're reaching those folks. Are you finding that in? Are you are you are you getting that data as a result of this program? Are you seeing uh, and are you sharing the the demographic data as well to know that you're you're getting folks that maybe have been underserved or underrepresented? Uh, Ms. Jimenez, obviously, that is an area that is crucial for this going forward in terms of assessment. Um, I think we all. And I'm sure the institutions want to make sure, the cultural institutions want to make sure that this is bringing in new folks who wouldn't be coming, who can't afford to come, rather than simply providing a free pass to those who are coming anyway. I think we all understand, you know, we, ha we can't do a means test here, but we need to assess to see that we're having the impact uh, in, in, across the board that we want to have. So that assessment is ongoing. Meanwhile, the, uh, each of the cultural institutions um, can set aside spots uh, for targeted neighborhood defined by zip codes or targeted in other, other ways. Um, and uh, I think that can be up to half. Um, so, you know, we're all trying to think creatively about how to make sure that this has, you know, it's, it's as, all, as in so much of library world, you know, you, you have to serve everyone freely, evenly but you know that you have to make extra effort to the people who need that effort even more, more strenuously. And that's true of getting the kids in the South Bronx to read more books as it is to get the folks in the South Bronx to come to the cultural institutions in Manhattan. And, and we accept that. So along that line, we've been able to take a look at our library card registrations by zip code, and we're starting to get into that data and mine that data as well. And so we have a breakdown of the top 10. And unpacking within that top 10, I think, is the unique challenge. So, for, ex <clears throat> excuse me, for example, Elmhurst, uh, Forest Hills, Woodside, Flushing, Jackson Heights, Corona, North Corona, Glendale, Ridgewood, Murray Hill, Mitchell Linden, Jamaica, Rochdale. So you're getting into some of that. But I think, as you know, in Elmhurst, you unpack Elmhurst. In Elmhurst, you have a rich demographic of people who are there from a variety of different uh, ethnic and religious and racial groups. And so, yeah, we're starting to see those numbers unfold as a result of the targeting. And then just to piggyback on something I mentioned earlier, it, it's fascinating in that the top three culture pass venues for Queens people have been Brooklyn Children's Museum, uh, MoMA, and the Children's Museum of Manhattan. And so they have been going outside of the borough of Queens to take advantage of it. So you've had that cross-pollinating of right. boroughs as well. Um, just to very specifically answer your question, the platform that we've built for this um, uh, project allows you to look at data by patron zip code. So we actually are able to follow and to see exactly um, where the demand is and who's using which institutions. <laughs> we were very aware of that also with the um, IDNYC free memberships. And so, you know, it was absolutely the case that people in affluent neighborhoods were getting free memberships. But I was talking to a very large Manhattan institution that has the largest membership. Well, it was the Met. Uh, <laughs> why do I beat around the bush? The Met told me that they had more members in Corona, and they have millions and millions of members within the first year of the um, free membership than they ever had previous to that. So there were more members in Corona Queens. Of course, that was the question I asked um, <laughs> than ever. And so that there, there were very large concentrations in parts of the city where there were very large numbers of cards being issued. So Corona obviously had a lot of those cards. I just want to say that that's absolutely a goal. And I know that we've been talking to the library system, and I've heard also that what uh, Mr. Mark said earlier that the idea of targeting zip codes 
is really a great idea to say that you can set aside a certain number of your uh, free passes to certain zip codes, which might be from underserved communities. So, Dennis, just to go back, your top three destinations are? Brooklyn Children's Museum, uh, MoMA, and Children's Museum of Manhattan. Wow. Uh, Children's Museum of Manhattan is very I know, we were talking about, in a hallway, right? matter of fact, um, yeah. And, and, and Brooklyn Children's, which, which is just rocking it, um, apparently, right? Number one in Queens? Is that Number one in Brooklyn as well. Number one in Brooklyn. And Tony, do you know your top three? I'll get back to you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> They're looking now. I'm sure it's uh, the Brooklyn Children's Museum, apparently. Um, <laughs> um, uh, which is great. Um, Dennis, I also want to thank you for plugging your gala um, as part of your testimony. No, I just happened to mention I, it in, you know, as an aside. That's all. I meant to say that earlier, and I, oh. I forgot. Tony. Cool. All right. I'm, 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 and, and the envelope, please. Um, the New York Public Library is proud to say that our top, uh, sorry, our MoMA, the Brooklyn Children's Museum, and the Children's Museum of Manhattan. Wow. Wow. Come on, Queens. We need. <laughs> and when we say MoMA, we're talking about all of MoMA or just MoMA PS1? No, PS1 no. is separate from. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, okay. And, and number two for Brooklyn is MoMA. Really? That's wonderful. Uh, I hope to talk to uh, uh, Glenn Lowry about that. That's um, a terrific, uh, terrific thing. And of course, we love MoMA PS1 as well, um, uh, equally uh, uh, in, in Long Island City in particular. Um, and are you uh, sharing the, the data that you're getting with the cultural organizations so they know that they're also um, seeing a different and more diverse an underreached population in their institutions, right? And yes. so they're able to uh, to maybe continue those relationships with those new users as well. Um, but uh, the two children's museums certainly indicate uh, a real desire for families uh, to uh, to take their children uh, to these great institutions and and to do so uh, for free. Blood alert for tomorrow. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, all of us. I'm, I'm not sure why my phone thinks I need to know about an Amber Alert in Hudson Falls, New York. I apologize. Well, you never know. Um, uh, so uh, uh, this is great. And I know we have some cultural uh, uh, partners who are here. Uh, as well to talk about this from from their perspective, but uh, uh, this is very exciting. Um, uh, exciting that you're all here doing this work, Tom. Just in closing, so I know you're 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 funding uh, uh, some more cultural programming at the libraries directly. Yep. Um, that is very exciting in terms of an outgrowth of uh, uh, our cultural plan work, and uh, uh, how do we increase the amount of funding that the Department of Cultural Affairs is actually providing directly to libraries uh, for cultural programming? Well, it's an excellent question. I mean, we this is the first time we've done it. I'm sure these guys would like to hear it. They're listening that. very closely. <laughs> I will say just that, no, and uh, seriously, we, we are providing the capital money to build the libraries in three different places. You, and so this has been a great partnership with uh, Brooklyn Library in two locations. And with Queens in one, and this is you know adds up to tens of millions of dollars. Um, and so, and th this is actually the first time we've ever done this. This uh, funding directly to the libraries. It was done sort of you know w w as we rolled this out, not right at the beginning of the year. This year we're going to get a much quicker head start. But we're re really encouraged with the uh, results last time, and also with the, our you know hopeful ability in the long run to support Culture Pass. I'm sure so, and I will. I also just wanted to to say, you know, that uh, Chair Van Bramer uh, was the person who passed the law with another council member, Steve Levin, requiring us, you know, which we embraced to do the cultural plan. That we did meet in libraries. Uh, I met some of you in libraries as well during that. Libraries are an active participant in the cultural plan. 
And the disconnect, let's say, the traditional disconnect between cultural institutions and libraries is not felt by New Yorkers. New Yorkers experience libraries and experience cultural organizations and, and are the patrons of us together, millions and millions of New Yorkers. So, you know, it was absolutely uh, an important thing to do, and we're so excited to be doing it. I look forward to all of you continuing to Thank work you, together and all of us working with you. Uh, uh, so this panel is uh, uh, excused, and we thank, thank you sir. all so much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, because they have been referenced so much, we have to start with Stephanie uh, at the Brooklyn Children's Museum and Leslie from the Children's Museum of Manhattan. Uh, and is Charlotte uh, here as well, of course, from the Brooklyn Arts Council? Uh, and then we have Melissa and Michael uh, in the next panel. We can't put five together, so we'll do uh, two panels, and uh, we're just going to take a two-minute break uh, before we start this next panel. gave it to him. Yours is nice and sweet. I can't read it. I can't read it either. I cannot read it. I don't know if my thing is going to Whatever. I'm just going to do what I need to do. It's really, it's really hurtful. I'm waiting for Dave. I want the flyer, okay? Oh, my gosh. It's freezing. I'm freezing. It's really, really I am cold. so cold. I hear you guys. I'm going to film you now. People can hear us. All right. All right, we are starting up again. Ready to go. Uh, thank you. So um, it's probably a lot of fun to sit there and hear so many people say so many good things about you. Um, so uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, and maybe, Stephanie, you can start since apparently you are. We are the, we are the number one. It's, this is, uh, I feel like I should thank the Academy. It's, it's an amazing, amazing honor. Um, good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Wilchfort, President and CEO of Brooklyn Children's Museum, a community museum in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and the world's first children's museum. We serve 285,000 children and caregivers annually, most of whom hail from our great borough. I'm delighted to be here today as one of the inaugural partners for Culture Pass. 
Being a part of this incredible collective impact effort has been a great gift for Brooklyn Children's Museum. Since we launched the program on July 1st, nearly 3,000 people have come through our doors at no charge, using culture passes that they've checked out at local libraries, including our dearest of friends at Brooklyn Public Library. Of our culture pass visitors, 60% are Brooklynites. The largest proportion, about 35%, come from our core communities in central Brooklyn, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brownsville, Crown Heights, Flatbush, East New York, and Prospect Lefferts Gardens. Another 14% come from South Brooklyn and 10% from North Brooklyn. We're delighted that 25% of our Culture Pass visitors are our siblings in Queens, many of whom have not previously visited our museum and our neighborhood. These demographics are really important because they show that for Brooklyn Children's Museum, the largest numbers of visitors through Culture Pass are coming from communities with some of the highest child poverty rates in the city. These are places where our institution can have the most impact, providing first cultural experience, experiences that spark curiosity, creativity, and lifelong love of learning. There is excellent research showing that museum visits support both socio-emotional and academic success. Culture Pass gives parents and caregivers a joyful tool to promote learning for families. But this isn't only about what museums can provide to families. It's also about what families provide to spaces like Brooklyn Children's Museum. It is the presence of people, their conversations, laughter, and cultural diversity that activate our institutions. More people from more places, from more backgrounds, lead to richer and more delightful experiences in our museums. I encourage everyone here to support this effort and also to support the cultural institutions that are participating. For those of us in neighborhoods with less philanthropic support, public funding from the Department of Cultural Affairs and the City Council is critical to the continued strength of our exhibits and programs. We are stronger partners for collective impact initiatives like Culture Pass and IDNYC when we have sustained and dependable public funding that accounts for inflation. I look forward to thinking together about how we might further contribute to Culture Pass. And I want to thank Chair Van Bramer for it being incredibly supportive of us and all of our fe fellow cultural institutions uh, over the last nine years. Thank you. Um, next, you're up. So, thank you. You're a very close number two or number three, right, to uh, Brooklyn. I thought Brooklyn. I heard number one. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm Leslie Bouchara. I'm the Deputy Director of Education and Guest Services at the Children's Museum of Manhattan. Thank you, uh, Chairman Van Bramer, um, for the opportunity to speak today. We really are honored to be here. For more than 30 years, the Children's Museum has partnered with the city libraries. We know that supporting literacy, helping someone to read and write effectively is vital to the future of both the individual, the child, and to everyone in our society. Or to paraphrase the Founding Fathers, if I may, uh, the success of our democracy rests on the literacy of our citizens. Libraries are essential partners with the museums in this work. We work together collaboratively. They offer welcoming venues and new audiences for us to share our programs, whether they're literacy-based, art, science, cultural. In fiscal year 2018 alone, we provided 116 programs in 22 different branches of the New York Public Library. And this past year at the Fort Hamilton branch of the Brooklyn Public Library, we ran a diverse range of programs from modern art to the solar system. Libraries are informal town halls for many neighborhoods. They serve as safe learning environments for all different types of learners. We appreciate that libraries have a willingness to open their doors to the museum and to our work and to partner with us, so much so that we raised private funds in order to bring free programs to libraries uh, for our new exhibit around Muslim cultures, America to Zanzibar. During that exhibit, we expanded our services to the Queens Public Library, and we delivered programs in Astoria, Jackson Heights, Corona Central, and Long Island City branches. Our work at the museum and in the community has taught us that children, parents, and caregivers enjoy learning in informal and fun ways, not to be, um, you know, sometimes um, approached by schools in a way that can make them feel scared or unsafe. Librarians and library visitors have embraced our teaching approach that supports and encourages these different learning styles, but it's also really clear that funding is needed for libraries and for museums. 
To that end, we were absolutely thrilled that the Revson Foundation, Niarcos Foundation, and New York Community and Trust invested in Culture Pass, which is a tremendous program. And especially to us, being on the Upper West Side, we serve the entire community and all boroughs. And to be able to welcome families, um, beginning in mid-July, we've had almost 2,000 families vis visit with Culture Pass from all of the boroughs. And we also decided to allot half of those passes in low-income communities. So we deliberately targeted to, to make sure that Culture Pass really welcomed a diverse group of families to the museum many who may have come for the first time, many in homeless shelters, and the different other programs and groups that we work with. And we are just getting started. So offering free, low cost, and reduced admissions remains a cr critical piece of what we do at the Children's Museum. We fundraise aggressively, and we try to make our programs available to as many children and families as possible, and we're deeply committed to continuing that. It's part of our mission. It's part of the ethos of what we do. We remain grateful to our partners, especially the city's public libraries, city agencies, visionary funders, and of course, to elected officials. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for your support. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. I'm Charlotte Cohen, Executive Director of the Brooklyn Arts Council, the leading nonprofit organization supporting Brooklyn's artists and small arts organizations. I'm very happy to be here today to report on our recent successful collaborations with the Brooklyn Public Library System. Um, you've heard a little bit from already from Commissioner Finkel Pearl and President Johnson about the um, new initiative that we uh, partnered with the library on this year. Um, our, our partnerships with the library connects artists to communities throughout the borough in alignment with our mission to serve and support artists. Uh, taking place at local library branches across Brooklyn, our program for Folk Arts and, and Artists series this spring included Midwood, Brighton Beach, New Lots, and Sheepshead Bay, amongst others. The series gave traditional and folk artists a presenting platform to share their talent and expertise with our Brooklyn communities. And over the course of only six weeks, we presented 10 folk arts programs at nine branches. In addition to sharing their work with the public, artists were paired with uh, documentary professionals who captured their presentations at each library. So these oral histories and conversations were recorded, and it also provided the artists with high quality work samples to support their future professional development and promotional efforts. So there were many um, Ten tenets of this program in place and taking place at one time. These programs were positively received by patrons and partners alike, and the branch supervisor of the Sheepshead Bay Library, Svetlana Negramaskaya, shared with us, thank you for bringing to our neighborhood an amazing cultural show and atmosphere. Our audience got a rare and unique opportunity to explore tra traditions of Mongolian, Pakistani, Georgian, and Bukharan Jewish cultures. Many audience members were encountering the beauty of these cultures for the first time. I still get asked for future similar programs and meetings. We were so thankful for this funding opportunity as it gave us a new way to collaborate on an innovative program to support Brooklyn's traditional artist communities. As part of our ongoing programming, Bach also partners with local library branches through our Community Arts Grants Program, which distributes hundreds of grants to individual artists and small arts groups every year. This summer, we held info sessions of our grants program in community centers across the borough, including local library branches in Canarsie, Midwood, Bushwick, Sunset Park, Williamsburg, and East Flatbush. Being able to partner with our local branches helps ensure that artists all over Brooklyn have access to resources and funding to support their work. And that means their work is getting out to those communities when they're funded by us. 
Additionally, our Creative Coalitions program regularly partners with library branches in Canarsie and East Flatbush to provide much needed networking opportunities for artists and community members to convene and dialogue. Without these partnerships, our work of serving artists would not be as far reaching as it is. Serving artists is at the core of what we do at Brooklyn Arts Council. These collaborative partnerships with peers like the Brooklyn Public Library help us to realize that goal, which aligns with one of the priorities set forth by the CREATE NYC Cultural Plan, which stresses increased support to individual artists. Bach is proud to have these collaborative relationships with our library partners, and we hope to see continued funding and support so we can sustain and expand on this necessary programming for the future. Thank you so much for your time and support. Thank you. Um, and uh, the Arts Council does great work, uh, and it's uh, good to see you working so closely with uh, the Brooklyn Public Library. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, um, uh, Stephanie uh, and Leslie, so it's great when more people come to your museums, um, but, uh, but it also can put pressure on the museums or create challenges that you didn't uh, uh, already have. And I know uh, the Children's Museum of Manhattan, I don't know how you fit any more people uh, into uh, that space, uh, which obviously is why uh, uh, another space is uh, uh, going to happen for you, but uh, but talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, it's it's great, but are there stresses on on a small institutions' budget? Are there staff are obviously um, uh, working harder than ever in a very good way? Yeah, in our case, um, there is some stress on our staff. We do um, want to make sure that we have the right programs, enough programs happening at enough times. Um, and there, so we have to, we have increased our staff, um, partly because of this program and some other programs that have brought more people to our museum. Um, we do have the great gift of a city-owned space that is large enough to accommodate visitors. Um, and so it's been our position that whenever we can engage in a program like this, we do open our doors at, at no charge as much as possible. Um, I will I will just, I just wanna, because I'm talking for a minute, um, I wanna add that we have not restricted by zip codes. And the reason we've chosen not to do that is that in Brooklyn, there can be some very great pockets of need in zip codes that are quote unquote wealthy. Um, so, you know, Dumbo, Farragut, and Vinegar Hill all share a zip code, but there are some very great pockets of need there. The same thing goes for Red Hook and uh, Carroll Gardens. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we were not limiting uh, anybody by zip code. Hmm. Uh, that's uh, interesting. I don't know, Queens Library, obviously, uh, I represent 11101. Uh, which includes Hunter's Point, where a lot of people see big glass towers going up. Uh, 11101 is also Queensbridge, um, and so incredibly important, obviously, and I'm sure the Queens Library is uh, uh, all over that, but that's, that's a really good um, uh, point. I want to thank both of you also, uh, and I'm sure Charlotte shares this uh, uh, desire to see more funding. Um, both of you did not miss your opportunity uh, to take your shot, and mention the need for increased funding for uh, the arts. That's exactly what you should do. Obviously, we're, we're uh, always fighting for more, but I, I am proud that we've actually been increasing the budget fairly steadily for both the Department of Cultural Affairs and for libraries. Always want more, always can do more. Uh, and that's kind of my life's work, right, is to fight for more money for libraries and culture. Uh, for 20 years for libraries, for nine years, uh, including for culture. Although I was president of Queens Council on the Arts, right. of course, before I was elected, so I was fighting for uh, <laughs> money for the arts before I was even elected as well. But uh, uh, it's it's great. So how many um, passes are available through Culture Pass at any particular time or each month, or how do you how do you decide that? Uh, we've do you decide that or does the library decide that? The, we've worked together with the right. library, but I believe it is one family pass. So, you know, in, in our cases, it's not one person, but it's a family of right. four or six people. Um, 
uh, per day per library. So you can check out one per day per library at every, in our case, at every library in the city. So we're making it available at every library. Mm -hmm. and, and ours is similar. And, and I would just say to answer that, we are, as you know, not a city-owned building. Um, and we are much smaller. But uh, our commitment to really making sure that all families come to the museum is really strong. It's part of our mission. So yes, we will have to have other staff and, and make sure that we have programs. But it's part of the ethos. It's part of who we are. If, if the museum is not diverse, which of course it is every day, mm -hmm. then that we are not meeting our mission. So this is part of that and we're committed to it. Mm -hmm. And just because uh, um, Stephanie mentioned it and uh, I come from a very large family, I'm one of eight. Um, mm -hmm. Do you limit it to a family of, of six? Is that actually a max? If if you, I mean, I know it's it's a lot more rare uh, today than it maybe was in my mom's time. But uh, if you have a family with seven kids and they, they need nine passes, is that possible or not even possible? In the we do serve many many very large families, and um, we don't limit it like that. I I think that it's possible that on the pass itself. Um, there is a limit to the number of people, but we at our front desk have a policy that we would never limit the number of people who could come on in a single pass. Right. And we have the same. I mean, can you imagine a family coming up and, and saying, well, we only have, you know, enough passes right. for four. The, the oldest four. Not... I'm number exactly. five in my family, so that would have really not worked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, of course, every family that comes is welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody left in the lobby. <laughs> yeah, no. And our lobby's too small anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you very much uh, for thank you. being thank you. Uh, thank you. participants, but also really great advocates. Um, and uh, and Brooklyn is well represented today, uh, as you so often are. Brooklyn <laughs> represents, um, uh, but uh, it's important to hear. Um, Jonathan did not do uh, <laughs> just saying. Um, uh, <laughs> but we love, we love Brooklyn. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, our last two panelists, Michael uh, Glickman and Melissa Diaz, if you guys are in the house, if there's anyone else. But this will be the final panel. I want to thank them for waiting and being participants uh, in this hearing as well. And whoever wants to go first. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Glickman, President and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. At the museum, our crucial mission is to educate diverse visitors about life before, during, and after the Holocaust. Through this, we honor the humanity and dignity of those slain and mobilize that memory in our shared fight against hate and apathy. Today, I wish to speak to the significance of our museum in New York's cultural landscape and the ways in which culture pass is an asset towards positive change and communal engagement. The museum is honored and pleased to be part of Cultural Pass, a important program in the city of New York. We signed on to partner with Culture Pass soon after it was envisioned, and we have seen remarkable results. In just over two months, we had nearly 1,000 passes issued. Of that, 77% have come from outer boroughs. Mm. We are an institution committed to being a productive member of the community. The Museum of Jewish Heritage has successfully partnered with different New York City organizations to share resources and to generate ideas on how best to serve New Yorkers. Proudly collaborative, we've cultivated partners from HBO to the New York City Department of Education, as well as other cultural institutions, libraries, museums, and others from across our great city. Partnering with Culture Pass is another way in which we help a wider range of New Yorkers access and explore our collection, comprising 40,000 artifacts, photographs, documentary film, and survivor testimonies. The Museum of Jewish Heritage is committed to being accessible to all visitors. Our audio guides are free, including our award-winning English tour with Meryl Streep, as well as those in Spanish, French, Hebrew, German, Russian, and Japanese. The museum offers multiple opportunities for free admission, in addition to the opportunities provided through Culture Pass. We offer free admission every Wednesday and Thursday evening, Cool Culture, which provides historically marginalized families with free admission, complimentary admission on commemoration days, and periods throughout the year. 
and free admission for families during various school breaks. In addition, the, muse the majority of the museum's public programs are offered free of charge. The work that we do is central part of promoting tolerance in the region's communities. In the past 20 years, the museum has welcomed more than 2 million visitors and helped to directly educate over 800,000 children. We have emerged as the primary resource in the tri-state area for the teaching and learning about the Holocaust and have become the third largest Holocaust museum in the world. 17 years after 9-11, the transformation and resurgence of Lower Manhattan is truly astounding. Part of what makes this area of New York City so attractive is the wealth of cultural institutions, one of the most diverse and concentrated groups of museums and historical sites in the world. Anchoring the southernmost tip of Manhattan, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, completes the historic landscape it shares with the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. Our vision, reflected as reflected in our name, has always been about being a living memorial, not simply a monument, but an institution of learning, understanding, and community building. Through vital tools like Culture Pass, we can further our mission and make New York City's remarkable cultural and educational opportunities available for all. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Melissa Diaz. Have you done? Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Diaz. On behalf of the American Museum of Natural History, I'd like to thank the chairman and the committee for the opportunity to discuss the Culture Pass program and the museum's collaboration with our city's libraries. The American Museum of Natural History is one of the world's foremost centers for scientific research and scientific education. Since its founding in 1869, our mission has been to discover knowledge about human cultures, the natural world, and the universe. The museum continues to uphold its commitment to education through the rich array of programs offered to the public. All these programs are structured to align with city and state educational standards and benchmarks dedicated to increasing scientific literacy, to encouraging students to pursue science-related careers, and to providing a forum for exploring the world's cultures. Throughout its history, the museum has also been dedicated to examining critical scientific issues, and it pursues its mission into the 21st century with cutting-edge technology, world-class resources, and a renowned scientific staff. The museum houses 34 million specimens and artifacts and is one of the largest natural history libraries in the world. It is the only museum in the country authorized to grant a PhD. The museum's collections and exhibits are a national treasure and provide an irreplaceable record of life on Earth. The museum is committed to affordability as it provides quality programming. Admission to the permanent halls of the museum is suggested, not mandatory. Roughly half of all participants in our education programs receive financial assistance. The museum welcomes 5 million visitors each year, including approximately 500,000 New York City school children who visit us through school and camp groups. While at the museum, they have the opportunity to participate in hands-on activities with trained education volunteers and re receive museum-prepared materials to enhance their experience, all free of charge. We offer several programs, one of which is Check Out the Universe, and now we are pleased to add Culture Pass. Culture Pass allows New York City library card holders to receive free admission to several New York City cultural institutions, including museums, historical societies, heritage centers, public gardens, and more. Through Culture Pass, the museum will make 250 passes available every month, which will provide visitors general admission and tickets to the Lafrac Theater for up to four people per pass. Since the program's inception in the beginning of September at the museum, 206 passes have been redeemed. Check Out the Universe is one of the programs which exemplifies the museum's working relationship with the public. Since May of 2000, the museum has provided over 12,000 vouchers annually through Check Out the Universe. Each voucher admits a family of five or less, so Jimmy, you just made the cut, <laughs> to the museum to either a space show or a special exhibit. In fiscal 18, there were more than 7,600 visitors to the museum through our Check Out the Universe program. By collaborating and utilizing all assets of the city, we can remain committed to our founding principles through public works. I thank you, Chairman Van Bramer, and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak before you. 
Thank you, uh, both of you. Uh, Michael, you mentioned that 77% of your uh, Culture Pass participants come from out of boroughs. 10% uh, I see from Queens, uh, which is great. How does that compare uh, to your traditional attendance figures? Uh, uh, what does that look like, and, and are you seeing increases from places that you weren't seeing them, or is, do you normally get 10% of your attendees from, from Queens? We actually get a higher percentage from Queens oh, really? um, than 10%. We're seeing about 30, uh, from a New York perspective, we're seeing about 35% coming from Manhattan, uh, nearly 22%, if I remember correctly, coming from Queens, uh, about 30% coming from Brooklyn, and then uh, we're, we're working on the Bronx and Staten Island. Got it. So you're... you're um You're more diverse, or, yeah, I guess 35% normally from Manhattan? Yes. And then with Culture Pass, 23%. Or taking advantage of that. And right. so we have unlimited passes. We um, have not put any restrictions, either by zip code or by the amount of users who can come through. We've issued about 1,000 passes in the two-month period, which has resulted in about 3,200 visitors coming through. Uh, we are free for children under 12, and we're also free for all New York City public school students who have a valid ID. So uh, the numbers are actually pretty good for us in that sense. That's terrific. And your, your uh, attendance is, uh, generally speaking, is moving in the... 63% ahead of where we were the year before, so year over year. And uh, in this new fiscal year, we're running about 20% over where we were last year. So uh, projections are actually moving in the right direction. That's very exciting for your institution. And, yes. Uh, for the city, obviously, we've been there a number of times over the years uh, to visit uh, you all. And the Museum of Natural History, um, you always have a lot of people. Um, uh, I, uh, I've never been there when there weren't uh, uh, a lot of folks there um, and you sort of have an endless capacity to take more folks in. No, I mean mm, we do see fuller days in the summers. Um, we have days in the summers where we'll get up to twenty-five thousand people in a day. Yeah, um, I think I've been there. Right, probably on that day. <laughs> yeah, um, and so <laughs> we do see a variety of different visitors. <laughs> it ebbs and flows, um, but they go through our twenty-six buildings with ease. Yeah, no, and obviously we've got. Lots of big, exciting plans uh, for you all in the right. works as well. Um, so you're going to have even more space uh, at some point to put even more people um, through those doors, um, which is very exciting. Um, so I want to thank uh, both of you for coming and being part of it uh, and, uh, uh, and contributing to this success story um, that starts with libraries and and uh, combines with our cultural organizations uh, and the Department of Cultural Affairs. So thank you all for being a part of it. Thank you all. And with that, our hearing is adjourned.